customers can also quit buying from you because you know you quit you quit caring as much um, which could lead them into they got a better deal by somebody else or you pissed them off be mindful of your money if you don't tell your money where to go it will tell you where it's gone So on today's episode, you're going to hear from a bootstrapped entrepreneur who's managed to build a barbecue sauce brand from a seed investment of 500 to over $50 million in gross merchant value. It's a great episode you do not want to miss, so do stay tuned. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast show. I'm your host, Kune Campbell, and the 2X e-commerce podcast show is dedicated to commerce insights for retail and e-commerce teams. Each week on this podcast, a commerce expert, a founder at a digital native consumer brand, a representative from a best-in-class SaaS platform comes on here, and I give them a tight remit to give you ideas you could test right away on your brand so you can improve commerce growth metrics such as your conversions, your average order value, repeat customers, your audience size, and ultimately your gross merchant value or sales. We are essentially here to help you sell more through stories and inspirational ones and that. Now on today's episode, I'm really, really, really excited to to have with me or what you're about to listen to is an interview I had with an entrepreneur called Cosmo Kosavi, Kosoravi actually. Um, Cosmo is very, very inspirational. Um, he's one of those, um, so, so he started out his, his career in um, Hazardous, um, disposal. So he was um, he was working for for the man. He was working for for an organization, and you know he was essentially you know um, clearing um, you know hazardous hazardous materials from um, from site to site. That that was his his day job. And then he became a parent, and having become a parent, he he learned the fine art of barbecuing, and he decided to. He actually had a talent of. Um, or has a talent of putting together, um, you know, um, taste and recipes in his head and kind of like figuring out what the taste would be ahead of actually putting, you know, the ingredients for a recipe together. Anyway, so his brand, Cosmo Q, is a barbecue sauce, um, you know, brand. So they do barbecue sauces, dips, um, powders and injections, essentially. Over time, um, he had built a community. He's a very com- content-driven, or Cosmo Q is a very content-driven brand, um, whereby um, they have over 300,000 subscribers on YouTube. They're, they're on every channel, you know, you can think of, whether it's Instagram, TikTok, you know, Snapchat, whatever. And, and that just brings in a lot of attention to his core brand. They're doing you know, um, well over $10 million a year in revenue and then all many channel brand. And we, 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 we really embrace channel agnosticism. We're, we're not necessarily very, um, we're not necessarily like maximalist to like one channel, whether it's like a, like DTC or, you know, Amazon marketplaces, we're more all many channel. And he's been able to, to really sort of align with his three core values. I, I resonated with, which is family, finance and freedom essentially um very very interesting interview um i i've developed a a methodology for growth um which i'll talk about in in subsequent you know um interviews but i use that methodology to to really quiz cosmo and i think i got a lot out of him it's a one hour long interview um it may be split into two parts um i'll think about it while I'm recording this, I'm, I've not made a decision as to whether to split it in two parts, but um, it's it's an hour long conversation from an entrepreneur who tells his story, and then we get into the nitty gritty of how he he's he's built it to to where it is today, and how he manages it day to day, and you know keeps to its core essence. He's 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 he, he's um, put projections of growing. Um, revenue by 40 to 50 percent despite you know um inflation which doesn't really seem to be hurting him which i find very fascinating um very very down to earth you know principled um entrepreneur who you know wants to do better who's 
you know, who wants to always, you know, challenge himself, who's a leader and who has a terrific story you're about to hear. So without further ado, get ready, get set and listen to Cosmo from Cosmo Q Barbecue. Cheers. Hey, Cosmos, welcome to the 2X e-commerce podcast. Well, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you, Kunle, uh, for having me um, all the way from right. Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. The internet is phenomenal. It's, it, it brings, it brings um, you know, it brings the world together, doesn't it? I'm, I'm here in Oxford, you're in Oklahoma, and, you know, we're making this happen. The audience is, we're, there are over 94 countries in the world. Um which was just phenomenal with the USA being um, the, the biggest, um, you know, base for us. Let's talk about you. Um, I've been looking forward to, to this interview. Yours is a phenomenal story from $500 in investment money and in, in, in seed money to, to, to 50 million cumulated revenue. You guys are an over $10 million brand. Um, but besides the money, um, this is your passion of yours, right? Barbecue, um, you know, sauces, you know, just barbecuing is, is a passion of yours, right? Absolutely. Absolutely is. The mm -hmm. one thing that I've learned is for some reason, for, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years, um, there's something about when a human creates a fire, how it brings people together, no matter what, no matter what the situation is, whether it be for shelter uh, for food or just for fellowship in general, when when you get to start a fire, it just seems like everything comes down, all the labels come off, and you just get to be yourself with your people. Mm. Yes, uh, that that is so right. I haven't really thought about it that way, but you know, if I think about some of my deepest conversations, they've been by fireplaces or by a fire pit with my best of mates. You know, um, just sitting, relaxing, or you know, by the barbecue. You know, so super, super, super interesting. Now, you founded Cosmos. Um, it's it's a multi, it's an omni-channel brand in the sense that um, you're in retail. You're through you know retail distribution. You're 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 direct to consumer. You're a marketplace brand. Before Cosmos, when did you found Cosmos, and what what did you do prior to to Cosmos? So prior to Cosmos, I was in the hazardous waste industry. I would drive around our little state and I would pick up hazardous waste and then we would dispose of it for uh, uh, companies and corporations. And, it, it, you know, it was it was definitely a uh, a career that helped support my family, um, mm -hmm. but it wasn't my calling. And I think a lot of people um, like me a lot of the entrepreneurial type, like you just have this calling about you that you can't explain you like, you don't know what it is. And I always, I, I would always try new things continuously. And people would say, well, you know, that's, that's Cosmo. He, you know, he doesn't get, he doesn't finish things. He doesn't do things, but I'm a, you know, I, I, I'm just, I was just searching for something that was in front of me the whole time. And, um, yeah, I remember driving home one day and I crossed the hill and I could hear it as I, like, like there was a voice in my truck and it said, what do you even value? You, you asked to, you ask so many questions, but you don't even have any values. What do you value? And I'll never forget. I, I, within about 10 minutes, I was at the house and I got on my computer and I created an entire list of things that, that somebody could value. And there was about 200 of them. And I said, I'm going to circle 50. And then when I got done with 50, I thought, oh, you know, in my head, I was like, oh, well, I'll sleep on it. And then tomorrow and I was like, nope, out of these 50, give me 25. Out of this 25, give me 10. Out of this 10, give me five. And out of this five, you tell me the three things that you value the most. And the things I came up with was family, finances, and freedom. And Absolutely. I think people hear finances a lot and they go like, oh, you're money hungry. And 
it couldn't be further from the truth. For me, it was I needed financial stability to achieve the freedom with the family. Because that to me is a life of happiness and a life that I want to live. And I woke up the new day or the next day and I was an absolute different person. I remember talk, going to my wife and I made six figures at the time. Good money. But I had Cosmos and I've been doing Cosmos at that time for a number of years. And I told her, I said, uh, I'm going to quit my job. And I'll never forget. She and I, I was afraid. She, I was afraid she's going to she's going to swing on me or something, you know. And she looked at me and she goes, "It's about time you do." Hmm. And that's when I, the scariest moment of my life, was, okay, I'm finally taking the leap. And I just remember telling myself, I heard this uh, from a Navy SEAL years ago. He asked me. He said, "Do you do you know what happens when you die?" Right before when you like right before you're dead, you always hear that your life flashes before your eyes. He says, let me tell you what happens. All your regrets flash before your eyes. Hmm. And I just sat there. The next day I was driving uh, to work and I was like, if I'm laying on my deathbed, what would I say? What hmm. would what would I verbalize that came out of my mouth? And I think I would be absolutely sickened with myself if I didn't at least try. Hmm. So, as I that that that, that, I, that that no, I I really resonate with with the core values. You know, um, you know, family first. Um, I'm a family man. Finances for the freedom. You know, and and happiness. Um. But you did say something just now, which is like Cosmos was a side gig at the time. I want us to go actually further back before even Cosmos was, how Cosmos was ideated. Um, what prompted you to, you know, to, to, to start, you know, putting sources, you know, in, in bottles, you know, essentially to, to come up with the name, um, what, what what were the first steps and, and what what time stamps are we looking at here in terms of when you ideated um, it and this turning point? Um, I think the ideation part came in late 2004. Uh, and, and just to back up to early part of that year, it was springtime. Um, I was uh, uh, we had a young family. And I was like, okay, well, there's no more doing all the, the single things. I got to start living like a, like a family man. So what do family men do? So they barbecue and grill. So I went down to Walmart and I bought a $50 smoker and I bought uh, a chicken, um, chuck roast and some sausage. And I was like, Saturday, I'm becoming a man. I'm going to barbecue. And I'm barbecue for my family, and boy, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna eat like, oh man, like it is the best day in the world. And Kunle, I can't tell you how bad this food was. It was so horrible. I'll never forget. We were sitting at the table, and everybody had a plate of barbecue, and I was like, "How is it?" I, you know. And my, they're all looking at me, you know, and they're like, oh, it, it's it's good. And I'm like, I took a bite and I was like, this is the worst food I've ever ate in my life. And I, I told my wife, I said, we can't eat this. This is unedible. It tasted like I've never ate tree bark, but I'm assuming if I was to eat tree bark, that this is what it would taste like. And I told her, I said, we, we have to throw it away. Um, so we ended up throwing it away. And I, I'll never forget the, the time stamp in my life that I realized it was my rock bottom, so to speak, as a man. When my wife was holding the dumpster open as I was throwing the food away, there was something that was inside of me. And I said, this will never happen again. 
And that's where it started. I said, I don't care if I'm only known as the hamburger and hot dog guy. This will never happen again. And that's where I started. And I started getting really serious. And this is before, like, this is before the internet. This is before YouTube. You couldn't, like, go someplace and find a recipe. You just had to find a cookbook somewhere and, you know, use the, the hope strategy. I hope I read everything right. I hope I cooked it right. And I hope it tastes good. And and that's where I started. That's where I started cutting my teeth. And I started day and night staying up all, you know, all night long. And as I started getting better at it, I noticed that the the because I was buying the 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 sauces and the rubs at the local grocery store. And I was like, this is this is okay, but like I want you know, like I, I want, I wanted to do this or that, or, you know, so I started experimenting with my own rubs and, and boom, I was, I was like, oh my gosh, if I push this, you know, if I push a little paprika or if I change out the paprika for a smoked paprika, and instead of using a, a table salt, I use a, a coarse kosher salt. Like I can really make these flavors do and act exactly how I want them to. And I quickly came to the realization that the stuff that's in the grocery store is not really for me so much as it is for profit Mm. because they all tasted the same. They all posted the same results. And that's when I was like, okay, well, you know, I'll start making my own. So what was what was your first flavor for for the Robs? Um, at the moment, you have quite a collection, you know. I have to say, um, you know, you, you even cater to to you know pilo and keto, you know, the clean eating space, you know. So mm. it's quite quite diverse. You know, you have the the barbecue Rob bundles, you have um, the classic Robs at the moment. So so what were your first um, Robs flavors? Who did you test? Who are your guinea pigs? And um, <laughs> where did that take you from there? So my first one was my cow cover and my dirty bird. Those were the first ones I made. That's the name of them now. Those were the first ones I made. Uh, And uh, I tested those on, you know, family, friends. And then I quickly found out that there's actually such of a thing called a barbecue competition. Mm. Who knew? Okay. And everybody, Mm. you know, you, 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 you go, you sign up, you meet in a, in a, in a, in a parking lot for the weekend and set up. So I was like, Shh, I'll go, I'm, I'm down. And I went to my very first competition barbecue event and I ended up winning the ribs division. And I was absolutely hooked, absolutely hooked. And yeah, from there, it just started, it started growing and uh, getting crazy. That's impressive. So that feedback from the competition really, really gave you that confidence. And, and okay, this is this l- looks like there's something going on here. Uh, and, and then, um, did you start packaging it and selling it in the competitions? Um, what was your go-to market strategy, and how did you come up with the brand? Um, you know, cos- obviously, Cosmos is, is your name, and um, your, the brand name is actually Cosmos Q. So, so how did you come up with the name and um, what did packaging and your first few customers look like? So um, I never had any intention of actually starting a company. Uh, I remember um, at the time there was another company selling barbecue, uh, an injection, and I, I was trying to use it, but it just didn't taste right. And I couldn't like it just it just had this weird flavor to it. And I remember seeing him at a competition and I asked him, I said, Hey, uh, um, I'm using, I'm using this injection and I just can't get it to taste right. Is there any way you can help me? And he was standing in his trailer and he looked at me and he said, yeah, you can read the instructions and shut the door in my face. And I was like, I was so pissed off that somebody would treat a customer this way. And honestly, like I I know the guy now, he's a great man, great individual. He's Mm -hmm. got a great company. Obviously at the time he had something going on that I was unaware of, but nevertheless, I went home and I said, 
okay, I'll make my own injection. And when I make my own injection, I'm going to start a company and I'm going to start selling it. And so it started out of uh, frustration. So I went and um, made my injections. And um, this is before uh, e-commerce was a thing. Uh, mm-hmm. I built a website and you could buy off the web. You could roughly buy off the website. You could turn in an order. You could, you know, and it would it would send me an email. And then I would, you know, PayPal you a link to pay for it. And then I would ship your stuff to you. So um, then I was like, well, this doesn't seem efficient at all. Uh, so I started uh, learning my HTML coding through PayPal and placing buttons on the actual website to where they could buy the products. And that's kind of how it all got started. It got started just because I was pissed off, really. A lot of things start off from, you know, um, from, from, from that sort of emotion and, and then, um, yeah, you, you want to fight everything, you know, and, 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 and make, make a point, you know, make, make a point um, with actions. Yep. Okay. Right. So, um, when did the, when, ha, what about the, let's fast forward a few years after, um, you'd gone full time with, with Cosmos Q and, um, when did things start getting serious? When did you hire? When did you say, hey, you know, I need help. Uh, I need to make my first hire. Um, so at the time, my very first hire was uh, a friend of mine's, uh, his kid. And I, at the time, I was working two jobs. Um, I would uh, work all day, usually 10 hours a day. And then I would come home and package orders for Cosmos at night. And then, you know, then my wife would help me. And it started in our linen closet, honestly. Like, it was just in our hallway in a closet, and I would pack orders out of there. And then it grew to where I had it in my garage. And then I had to build a shop. And then next thing you know, we started, we got on Amazon. I was like, I'm going to need some help. So I hired um, uh, one of my good friend's sons, and he would come over after school and I showed him how to ship orders and all that. And uh, that's when I was like, okay, well, this is this is kind of working. And then, and then I had to hire another kid. And then I had to hire another kid. And then we looked up one day and we was like, oh, my gosh, you know, we're in 2,000 square feet and it's stacked to the ceiling. We need to get a warehouse. So we found a warehouse um, and... Then we then it, then it started getting real serious. So by this time, I had already uh, quit my job and I was working full time at Cosmos. Um, we got into this warehouse, and within uh, I think we had about three thousand square feet of warehouse space. Mm-hmm. Um, then we had to rent another two thousand square feet behind us, so we're in about five thousand square feet. And then quickly, very quickly, we go, this isn't going to work. So we had to rent a 12,000 square foot facility. And yeah, that's how it kind of all very, just very started tr- ramping and, up. And, and, and then where, 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 what's your setup now, like um, from a warehouse standpoint? So from, the, from a warehouse standpoint, we're still in 12,000 square feet. Um, the thing that we did that really helped us is, is we started, we, I'm, we are very big on data here. Um, and I, uh, I've heard this said, you know, trust in God, all else bring data, you know? So True. we are very big in data. So we started getting really serious about our inventory and how we could control our inventory and our logistics to better suit our need. And actually, since we've been in this, we've actually doubled again in size and we're still operating out of the same warehouse, but we're running just in time inventory. And we are also using our manufacturing facilities as uh, direct shipping points rather than bringing bringing the products here and shipping them out. We will just uh, place specific orders at the facility and ship directly from there, which has allowed us the convenience of being able to grow and still retain the same square footage. 
for 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 agility so from i guess you're fulfilling direct from from the kitchen um for dtc and then for wholesale you're probably just keeping in in the warehouse i think right now mm -hmm. correct yep okay makes sense makes a lot of sense just going back um two questions i have is um where did your first 1000 customers come from and and then i, I just want to just out of curiosity um when you were when you were in the smaller warehouses, were you using your 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 home kitchen, or did you then sort of rent um, a facility out to 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 to, to actually produce um, you yeah. know, um, the robs and the injections? Yep. So my first one thousand customers came from uh, a combination of my Facebook page and the competitions that I would go and cook at, you know, every weekend or two or three times a month. Um, that's where they came from. I didn't have any, mm. there was no such thing as, I, I don't even think uh, you, you, there was no online ads at the time that I was aware of as far as Google or Facebook. Or, uh, none of that YouTube wasn't even around when we got started. So, so we kind of bootstrapped everything through our uh, personal website or our, through our personal Facebook page. Um, as far as, what was the second question again? The second question was like at the start, um, before you, you went into the bigger facilities, um, whether you used your home kitchen or you used, you know, a commercial okay. yeah. kitchen to, to put together the recipe. No. So since day one, we have used uh, commercial uh, co-packers. And okay. I don't know why, um, honestly, other than the fact I just, I remember telling myself this. I remember asking this of our very first co-packer. I said, if I need to order one truckload of one product, can you guys produce that? And they said, yes. And I said, okay. And I always, I, I would love to say that I had the vision of, oh God, you know, we was going to, we was going to uh, double year over year, make the Inc. 500 and we was going to do all this because, so I needed to know that information, but that wasn't it at all. I actually don't even know why I asked that question. I just have a, if my customers need something, I need to know that you are set up and geared in such a way that you can produce a quantity on demand. Which makes absolute sense. Makes absolute sense. So my takeaway from from the answer of your first question really is that um, you'd built a personality on um, on Facebook and obviously offline from the competition. So you're quite an authority essentially, you know, um, in in both spaces, both you know, with with the Facebook page and um, with the competitions you were winning and participating in, and and that sort of built community essentially around you, you created content, you, you stated your opinion, and you happen to have something to sell, you know, which was the barbecue sauce and um, the, the barbecue robs and the injections we're using in, in the competitions. And, and that sort of, you know, built out that um, first 1000, um, you know, um, customer base, I think. Absolutely. That, that, that is okay. absolutely correct. Although I, I, I wish I could say I had it all planned out. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, I, I, I the, think we, we was we was doing that before, uh, you know, before it was a thing to you know grind day and night and become the authority mm. and get people to like know and trust you. Mm. Mm. Super super interesting. Okay, so um, how has the business matured over time? So I'm comparing the business in say 2010 to 2020. Do you want to give <laughs> A, oh, a before and after or comparison because it's you know a, de a spread a decade spread you know you you were five years you were about five six years old in 2010 and, and now in 2020 you know with covid striking how how please shed some light on, on those dynamics oh that's a great question Kunlai. um <laughs> man it was uh uh, in the beginning, it was we did our best to get all of our work done before noon so we could go screw off. Um, and we just wanted to have fun. You know, everybody, you know, we need to understand that, you know, we're, we're here. We're here to provide our customers with the best injections, rubs and sauces in the, on the market. 
and we need to do everything for them, but we need to do it as uh, um, efficiently as possible so we can go have fun. Uh, back then, I had uh, I went from one to three part time employees, and now I oh man, I'm gonna get in trouble for this. I think we have 26 uh, team members. Um, Mm -hmm. some part-time, some full-time, some, uh, contract, some not contract or or some are full-time. Uh, golly, we have an employee handbook. We have an HR department. We have a CFO. We have a director of operations. We have, um, obviously, uh, founder, president, and CEO. We have, we have an org chart. We have, um, we have daily huddles with the entire company. We have daily mm-hmm. departmental hump and, uh, huddles with uh, the departments. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I looked up the other day. I just said this the other day. I said, I said when I quit my job, I never wanted to work for another corporation again. And if I could go back and change it, I would say – when I quit my job, I never want to work for a corporation again that doesn't do it the way I think a corporation should do it. Mm. Because now that's what we're doing. Mm. Mm. And, 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 and is, is your staff global? <laughs> Are they all based in Oklahoma? Um, how, how does that, how do, how do you, what does your team sort of spread look like geographically? So, so we have, um, we have uh, um, people here in Oklahoma, and we also mm-hmm. have uh, uh, a remote team as well. Okay, okay, makes sense. Makes sense. Right. Um, let's talk about customer customer centricity um, at, at at Cosmos Q. Um, is would you say your customers are front and center in, in everything you do, and why? And how? Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. They have to be, because if you're doing it about you, and this is this is just my belief. If it's all about you, you can only run that game for so long before people start finding out. When you make it all about them, and I believe that I was put on this earth to serve others, and that's what I believe in my heart of hearts, and I'm here to serve our customers. Um, to give them the best products with the best price, with the fastest shipping, with the best customer support. Um, that's what I believe. 100% it, it is like it, it's our customer support team. They know they have the responsibility and the authority to do whatever it takes to make that customer happy. They don't have to run it up the pole. They don't have to come talk to me. They don't have to talk to their supervisor. They don't have to do any of that. If if mm-hmm. this customer, you know, spent seventy dollars and it was absolutely destroyed, I say give him give him the order for free and then give him a gift certificate, you know, for fifty dollars. If that makes him happy, that's awesome. Uh, if that doesn't make you happy, if that doesn't make them happy, find out. Ask them what can I do to make this right by you. And whatever they say, you go above and beyond. Hmm. Hmm. Super interesting, super interesting. Um, how do you collect like customer data? What, what, what systems have you put in place to, to actually watch and learn from customers? Um, um, we have a, we have a couple different ways we, uh, collect data, obviously the email list. Um, I think that is, uh, the, you know, one of the most powerful things you can do. If you don't have an, if you don't have an email list, that should be the, the first thing you do, uh, tomorrow morning is get that up and running. Um, but then we also, so it's kind of, I need to actually put this in a, like a, I need to visualize this so people can see what it is in my head. It's like the email list is in the middle, but you have things feeding, like streams feeding the email list. Um, So whether that's uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, YouTube, 
Um, and that those are things that just that give to the customers. And that's what we want to do on all of our social channels. We want to just just give them information, give them education, give them knowledge, give them um, give them the, the OK to go ahead and start cooking. Because for a lot of people, that is really scary. I know it was for myself. Um, I wish I had the information that we now give away for free every single day um, because it would have probably saved me. I probably could have ate that first meal. (laughs) But so we use email and then obviously uh, we use our website. We use our um, all of our social media platforms. So we want to really see the customer journey um, and how they interact with us. So we can visualize the things we are good at, but the things we're not good at. And Hmm. I've always heard that people quit buying from you for one of two reasons. You quit selling to them or you piss them off. Hmm. And, you know, customers can also also quit buying from you because Um, I think customers can also quit buying from you because much. You know, um, you which could lead them into they got a better much. deal by somebody um, else, which could lead them, them into off. they got a better deal by somebody else or you piss them off. Um, so we really try to understand the customer journey and see where we can uh, put ourselves into the gap to best fulfill the need they have at that present time. Mm. So do you speak with customers? So is your customer service, um, yes. you know, reachable by phone? And um, Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. okay. We do. We, we so, speak with them daily, uh, obviously. Uh, we send them update emails, tracking emails, where their order's at, emails, surveys. Mm-hmm. We ask them, you know, mm-hmm. ask them questions. And honestly, we ask them if we can just call them sometimes. You know, mm-hmm. hey, can we just call you and just, you know, just get some feedback? You tell us. Have any of your recipes been crowdsourced by um, by by customers? So um, have customers have a ha, have customers had a direct? Um, have they had direct input into um, some of the you know product releases you've you've you've, you've, you've done or you've been involved in? Um, when you say crowdsourced, you mean funded or? Oh no! I, I mean, um, just wisdom of the crowd, um, where customers okay. are you no. know, asking for a particular, you know, flavor for rub or you know, an injection, and um, you listen yeah. and then. Absolutely, yes, they have, and it's so funny um, sometimes when we have one that's not performing very well, and we pull it off the market, it, and everybody's like, "Ah, what are you doing? You got to bring that back." So you know, then we talk about ways we can bring it back. Um, but yes, yes, some of them have. Um, we also have a private uh, community, um, which is our uh, um, uh, it's our private Facebook group that that um, you pay to get into, and it's just a, a one-time okay. lifetime fee. Once you pay to get in, you're in for life. Uh, we will okay. also send them the products. They they get first dibs to all, everything. Okay, and um, that's interesting. And very we really value their feedback We because they participate with us. And they, they mm-hmm. will tell you, hey, man, this isn't that good. Or this is mm-hmm. exceptional. But I think if you, you know, did this, I think it, you know, may do better. So mm. so it's a, it's a paid member focus group, essentially. Um, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. No, no. I wow. never thought wow. about it that way. But, yeah, you're right. Wow. Well, uh, and so, so what's what's the fee? What's a what's a one time fee? And how many members do you have? Um, I think last we looked, we was about six hundred members, and it's a two hundred ninety seven dollar fee. Uh, okay. um, but I will tell you, it is going up um, okay. this next round. And mm-hmm. we, and the, the the thing I love about it is it's a it's a safe place. So there is no dumb question. Um, a lot of these barbecue forums and a lot of these uh, barbecue sites, it, it just seems like the second, you know, if somebody is new, they ask a question, every, all the, the, you know, the 
well, they're not, I, I don't call them experts because they're not experts, but all the novices, you know, with, you know, who've had a bad day can jump on them and crack on them and beat on them a little bit. And we don't allow any of that. I mean, none. If somebody asks a question, we give them, we give them honest feedback in a loving, respectful manner. And if anyone is uh, ever caught doing that, we remove them from the club. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, I think content is like, from, from what I've seen, I've done some very, very light diligence on, on, on you guys. And content seems to be like very important. It's a very, very important pillar in in your in the experience you deliver, um, particularly pre-purchase or, you know, just engagement through engagements. I mean, you invest a lot in very high quality videos. Um, your YouTube channel is over 300,000 subscribers. You have a sizable Facebook page. Same thing with Instagram in the hundreds of thousands. Um, I know we don't want to sort of have a favorite channel, but but ha- what, what do you think has been your <laughs> fundamentally <laughs> most... Um, most effective what what channel do you think is is that foundation um for for, for bringing attention um at, at a very cheap rate because you, you did talk about something where like you you said email is that core and and then um you know all other channels whether it's instagram whether it's tiktok whether it's youtube we're also feeding into that into the you know harvesting or or the the build of that email list so so which which platform do you think is fundamental it, it looks from from all it looks like video is is like the primary you know media type mm-hmm. but, but what channel is 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 fundamental you know um, to, to i would say f- for us is youtube hmm. the youtube so content you youtube first um, brand, I, I, I guess it could be said that way. Cause we do get found a lot on YouTube. We do get found mm. a lot. Um, but it's, it, it was never made as a collection device. It was always generated for knowledge and education for free. Mm. 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 Makes sense. Makes sense. So, so you're really being helpful out there and, um, yep. Um, people want to find out more essentially. Yeah. Super, super interesting. Okay. Um, let's go down a little bit into, um, I, I, I always like to talk about, um, like habitual purchases, you know, um, in terms of like repeat customers, you're, you're in the, you know, food business, um, your, what 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 is retention like? Um, do do you have do you offer like um, subscription services or um, do people just come and buy? Um, do do you want to shed a bit more light or is it seasonal? You know when the weather is good. I, I know in America, not you know like Texas, the weather is good all year long. Yeah. So more southern states. So how do you do? How do you get people to be habitual? You know um, purchases besides just making the products fantastic you know fantastically right. good no no that's a great question um we try to meet them where they're at <coughs> excuse me bless you uh, we try to meet them where they're at um the one thing that we do know about our customers is um for every one that comes in the door 36 percent are repeat buyers in four months or less um of those 36 percent 50 55% roughly buy again within the next two months. And of those 55%, it's like 83% return again before the one year mark. Okay. So okay. I, I was telling somebody those numbers the other day and they're like, well, you know, that those are phenomenal. I'm like, eh, not really. Like I, 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 I want a hundred percent of everybody that bought wants to buy again. I'll settle for 80, you know, so we need to work on that. Yeah. Um, but, but there's, there's, us, there's also about, a met- sure. No, go ahead. Well, for you, it's about, I was going to say for us, for us, it's about, it's, it's, we don't want to be the, um, we've all signed up for the emails and all of a sudden it's just like, you're just getting, you know, you, you feel like you got a used car salesman on you. You know, hey, you want to buy, 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 you want to buy. And it's just over and over again. And finally, you go, no, if I wanted to buy, I would have bought. Um, 
we try not to be that person, but we also want to be the person that, you know, maybe you bought a rub. Maybe you have no idea that we have sauces or wing dust or wing sauces or barbecue glazes. So we try to, you know, just say, hey, you know, we, you know, have you thought about or did you know or here's a video, you know, something like that to, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to properly put our free tools in front of you on your barbecue journey. Hmm. Hmm. Powerful, powerful. Um, what I was going to say is that, um, you, you know, I, I, we're working with a brand now whereby their, um, their repeat customer rate is or repeat purchase rate over a, um, four month period is about 35%. However, mm -hmm. they account for 70% of revenue. So it's, it's not always too bad when, um, if you do the math, but obviously when you, you know, cover more ground, I, I guess you, you get yeah. more percentage in terms of, you know, share of revenue, but phenomenal numbers, nonetheless, very, very phenomenal numbers. I'm very, very much impressed. And I, I love the fact that, um, you, you have the metrics to hand, which, which is, which is fantastic. Right. My, my next question has to do, um, with, um, experimentation, um, like within your organization, um, and department, um, you, you know, I think you talked about hurdles, um, and, and I really mm -hmm. want you to just share a bit, <clears throat> sh shed some light on, on hurdles and how you, um, how you view failure you know, um, in, you know, let's say the barbecue sauce doesn't really look good or you, you know, the department selected the wrong fulfillment partners. How do you fulfill, how do you view value within departments, within your organization? Um, and, um, what is your take on experimentation on, on just, um, it's being iterative essentially. Yeah, this is, this is an easy one for me. Anybody that knows me knows I want to fail fast and I want to fail often failure. I, mm. I, I I'm, I'm going to stop just short of saying I love it, but I kind of really do because that's data. That's data. If, if anything you're doing is you're, you're checking the list off on what not to do, which is going to, you know, just by default, push you to what you need to be doing. So I absolutely love failure. I love testing. I love split testing. I love, I, I, I'm a fan boy for all of it. Uh, failure, that is a great question, Kunai. And I tell you, like, it, this strikes me to the core of who I am as a person. I remember as a kid, you know, it, it, I was told, sit down, shut up, be quiet, don't do that. You can't go there. You, you, you can't, you can't, you can't, don't do, don't. And I thought, why? Why wouldn't you want to know? You know, why wouldn't you want to know? And it's just, it, it, I tell you, you know, it, I, I, I found out later in life that I'm built different than a lot of people. Um, speed and agility is, is absolutely my strengths. Um, my weaknesses are sometimes I operate too fast <laughs> with too much agility, but I also know that. Um, and I try mm -hmm. to surround people with me that can help offset that. And I can build on their strengths and they can build on mine and we can go together. But I, I absolutely, absolutely think failure is, is key to growth. Is, is that a selection criteria you have when um, you're, you're, you're recruiting or hiring senior members of, of, of your team? I think for me, um, when we, re what I look for in a uh, team lead is somebody that is feedback driven, somebody that's unafraid to fail, and somebody that is, that understands details, um, the details, the details, man, you got like, I... Man, I do some of the weirdest stuff. Like, I, I'll walk through the warehouse, and if there's one piece of stick laying on the ground, like one piece of pallet, and I go, "How many people walk by that 
you know, without picking it up. Yep. 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 And, and, and I look for things like that and I go, you know, and then I'll see somebody pick it up and I'll go, that's paying attention to the details. The yep. customers don't care about stuff like that. But when you pick that little piece of pallet up off the floor, I know mm-hmm. that when you're handling somebody's order and pick packing and shipping it, that the details matter to you and you're going to make, be made, you're going to make sure it's packed correctly. You're going to make sure that, um, it ship correctly and anything that goes on, the details matter. It's actually one of our uh, um, core values. You know, mm-hmm. we pay attention to details because details matter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I resonate with you. Uh, um, the other question I wanted to, to, to ask was around how you approach channels, you know, um, and, and there are two sort of layers or two ways of, of looking at channels. One's sales channels, you know, where the sales actually come, the ding dings, mm-hmm. um, through the website, marketplaces, you know, w- whether it's big wholesale orders and also channels, I think we've already addressed it, the second, um, you know, classification channels, which are just, you know, marketing channels, channels in which you use to, to reach to, to new audiences, to audiences essentially and communicate, but going into like your, 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 your your sales channels, you know, um, in terms of uh, you, your set, I, I did mention you're an omni-channel brand. How important mm-hmm. has it been to the maturity of, of Cosmos Q in 2022? Um, it's been very important. Um, I believe in omnipresence. So if you see us on Facebook, I want you to see us on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, uh, Snapchat, YouTube, all of the channels. I want to be all, we have the content that obviously there's chat, uh, uh, platform specific audiences. So send it, send it all out. Um, the same thing um, with our retail partners. I believe in a method I like to call um, my upstream downstream method, meaning it's easy. It's easy to get on a boat and do nothing and go downstream. I can talk to everybody so those are my downstream are like my friends, family, uh, people around me, the, the people that I get to just relax and talk to. Um, then I got uh, my side stream. Those are the little creeks that go up. Those are my mom and pop uh, hardware stores, barbecue shops. Those are the people that it takes a little bit more effort to get into them. But once you get in them, you know, it's it's usually smooth water. You can have a conversation and it, it's just very natural. Um, the hardest one, the one I always this is this is what I believe that you should wait to crack last is your upstream. Anybody that's ever tried to row anything upstream knows it is extremely difficult. Mm-hmm. But you don't grow from safety. You only grow when you step outside of your comfort zone and do something that's that's tough and hard and makes you work. And those upstream ones are our large retailers, um, locations that ha- that may have, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200 locations. They're harder to get into. They're harder to get in front of the right person. They're harder to, to try to sell them on. They try to beat you down on price. It's just extremely difficult. But the amount of product that they can turn in one day versus me selling, you know, at a, you know, at a barbecue competition, the numbers aren't the same. And that's why it takes more work to get into those. Um, mm. That's kind of my method, you know. I don't know well, if it's, no, it's, uh, it's, um, it's. I don't. I don't know if it's, it's right. It's amazing. But, you know, it works. <laughs> no, it's it, it's very logical. It makes makes a lot of sense. So upstream, who, who, where, where can you get Cosmos Cosmo Q products up, upstream now, um, from, from um, the bigger retailers? Um. So there, there's Amazon, uh, Ace Hardware, Walmart, soon to be uh, Lowe's, True Value. Mm-hmm. Geez, there's a. There, there's a couple more. Uh, uh, all, all the major ones, okay. Uh, yeah, Bucky's, I don't okay. know if you've ever been to a okay. Bucky's. No, but I have been to Walmart. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, question um, is: Are you measuring any sort of conversions from other channels to D 2 C, where you know people are trialing 
you know, um, Cosmos Q rubs or injections or, you know, um, or powders in these side stream or upstream channels and saying, you know what, I could see the website here. Um, it's, it's just, um, you know, cosmosq.com. And then they come to your website to, 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 to build that direct one-to-one -one relationship. So we do measure our conversion rate um, on our mm -hmm. website. We also measure it on <coughs> um, Amazon and um, uh, some of the other platforms that allow us the view through to see that information. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing we're finding a, it, it difficult to see is when does a customer turn from a direct consumer from when do they convert from your website to a storefront we mm. don't know that data we don't know when they make that jump all we can do is assume that they make the jump by looking at the sales in both so we put new incoming customers into our website and then once they like know and trust us then they may find us at their local walmart ace you know right. whatever so um, they're both growing. I, I wish there's a way that we could uh, um, gather that information. I just don't know yeah. that it's possible it's, right now. Yeah, you, you might you might want to try post purchase um, surveys. Um, so in the DTC, you know, um, you could ask a few questions. There's a really nice app called Enquire Labs. You, you're you're on Shopify, right? Shopify Plus. So with Enquire mm -hmm. Labs, um, you're able to, uh, we actually um, interviewed the, the founder of Enquire Labs on, on this show. You're able to sort of ask questions immediately. They make that purchase. You could say, you could you could ask just first time customers. You could ask repeat customers. You could ask, ask both cohorts. And, and those questions could be like, you know, have you ever bought us in retail? You know, and where? Where, where did you mm. first find out about, you know, about our brand? And, and the opt-in rates are like 40%. So statistically significant most of the time. So it might be worth, um, you know, trying that out. Inquire okay. Labs, got it. Inquire Labs, yeah, yeah. Um, very good app. Finally, I, I want to talk about um, your. What should we talk about? Um, operations. You know the team. Um, you know from a supply chain. How, how you know um, from a supply chain standpoint. Um, how you use contract um you know manufacturers i guess um to mm -hmm. to 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 put you know to to scale uh, and then you're also shipping direct um for individual orders um mm -hmm. how's how's it evolving from an r and d standpoint how are you making iterative you know changes to 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 your offering um that is <laughs> That is awesome. I actually, we, this is probably one of my biggest uh, um, failures in the business. I never really thought we would get to a point that we would have to look at the data in that sector so well. So we jumped into that game late. Um, since then, we have uh, implemented a WMS into our warehouse. Um which we are getting up and it's actually up and running, but we don't have the, the see through on the data the way that I want to see it yet. Um, we should have that in the next two to three weeks. Um, but the one thing we do do well with our co-packers is um, just in time manufacturing. So we yeah. set up where they, we give them our cell numbers and, and I told them flat out, hey, I don't want to I don't want to have to send you POs. Um, would you rather write them? And they were like, you mean you let us write our own PO? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Just don't let us run out of product. Don't overproduce and always keep a back stock in your warehouse. So if, if, if we need it in a hurry, we can pull it in an emergency. And um, hmm. so far three well three of them have agreed to it one of them is not so good at it uh two of them are phenomenal at it and mm. it's it's just it's just it's you know the data let the data pass through is what i was like like we don't if if we're going to gather this information let's give it to them you know Mm. Let's let them know where we are so they can, you know, heck, I wish somebody let me write checks for them. I'd write checks for you, you know. <laughs> 
Um, I've got a bit of good news for you. Um, I can get Cosmos Q in the UK. Um, you're yes, on you Amazon can. UK. Yes, I can. Yeah. I actually just searched for it, and um, there, there you guys are. You're on Amazon UK, which is, and you're you're also in a you're in a UK website called Black box barbecue.co.uk um so uh -huh. quite extensive stuff quite extensive stuff i have to say you know here in terms of what you guys are you know are doing um the final question i have is you know we're in 2022 now um we're definitely in a recession even though you know um we need to we need a few more weeks to confirm you know two straight um quarters of negative growth are um a recession essentially um ha you know with the consumer brand and food and beverages, um, I think you guys are in a, a kind of like a good place, you know. Um, but what's your take on inflation um, at this point in time? Um, and what's your outlook over the next 12 to 18 months? What advice would you give to, to listeners? Um, my personal, um, I'm not an expert in the field of uh, financial stuff. But then again, I'll be honest with you, I don't trust anybody who is. I'm very old school. If you can't explain it with a crayon, then it's probably way too complicated and nobody's going to understand you. I think the next 12 to 24 months is going to be rough. It's gonna, I think it's going to be real rough on some people. Um, for me personally, the advice that I always take and the advice that I give to my uh anybody in and around me that asked for that uh, asked for that advice, be mindful of your money is be if mindful of you your don't money. tell your money where to go it will tell you if you don't tell your money gone. where to go it will tell you where it's gone um i believe in spending money with uh brands and companies that align with my values uh and I also believe in living under your means. Um, it, uh, I don't know if I'm just wired this way or <clears throat> there is too many people out there going broke, trying to look rich. And I think that there's been so much cash put on the street that, you know, eventually – it, it will, you know, it, you know, it, it, it's kind of like cream. It always rises to the top. The people that are really good at getting money are really good at getting money. And the people that are really good at spending money will be really good at losing money. Um, unfortunately, mm. Mm. I think we're, I think we are in a good spot. Um, not because we're the cheapest, um, because we're not but we are the best and when you want to you know when you want to make that steak uh for your for your wife on a friday night but you know damn good and well you can't go out and spend a hundred dollars on, on a meal and you're going to make it at home um i think that's where we intercept well because with a uh you know one or two of our seasonings, you'll be able to make steak for from now till six months from now, and it's going to be the best steak you ever had in your life. And if don't worry if you don't know how to make it, we have recipes, we have videos, and we have how tos on how to show you how to make the perfect steak. And in 2015, I won the world steak championship, uh, and the one thing that it has taught me, and I have actually produced that video twice, uh, two or three times, a backyard version and two competition versions on YouTube, is that once you make that steak, I'm going to ruin you from eating out again. Super, super, super interesting. It's, it's kind of like how I discovered um, like this clean coffee. Um, so I take coffee with collagen in the morning. And um, since I've started, I hardly ever go to coffee shops um, in the morning. And I was like a soccer for co for coffee shops. I just used to go. And, and I think it also circles back to, and it's a very important point you're making in the sense that um, with the 
with with the economy going where it is, you know, people would be inclined to eat less and you know make their own food. And so it's an incredible, incredibly, um, you know, um, important time for you know brands like yours, um, whereby you're you're bringing the you know pretty much um, gourmet style, you know, um, you know, tasting taste to the home without having to to go out to, to eat out. Yep. No, you're absolutely right, and and it's not going to break the bank. Like it's not going to. Yeah. It's not going to set you back like a, a night, you know, with you and the missus out at a, at, at a even, even just an average, you know, restaurant. I mean, you're looking at, yep. what is it now? 70, 80, hundred dollars, you know, more, more. How many, how many, how, how many steaks could you buy and, you know, yeah. and, and make a nice mixed salad with a, with a nice, you know, uh, uh, baked potato, it just it just makes sense, and even to go back further into uh, what I said at the very beginning, fire brings people mm. together. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a fire chat, there's fire fireside chat here <laughs> without the fire. Yeah. All right. Um, we we'll go on and on and on and on. I mean, this is definitely an hour long thus far. Um, I want to sort of wrap this up with our evergreen rapid lightning round. Like we call it a lightning round. Sometimes I call it rapid fire. You know, round. It's a lightning round where I ask you about five questions, and if you could use a single sentence to answer each of the questions, you know, it will be a okay. Okay, let's do it. Okay, uh, let's do it. Are you a morning person? Yes. Okay. Do you have a more? What is your morning routine like? My morning routine is I get up at five a.m. I go to the gym, work out, uh, do my uh, quiet time and meditation, and go to work. All right. What two things can't you live without? Ooh, cold beer and barbecue. I'm going to get beer after this. All right. And barbecue. Yeah, good stuff. Okay. Um, what book are you currently reading or listening to? I got it right here, actually. <laughs> uh, profit first. Profit first. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, final question is, what's been your best mistake to date? By that, I mean a setback that's given you the biggest feedback. Uh, the biggest, mis- the biggest, best mistake. Your, your best mistake to date that has given you the best feedback, the biggest feedback. Oh, golly. I think I, I have to go back to what my dad, my dad has always told me this. If you don't want to listen, life will teach you everything you need to know. Hmm. Super, super interesting. Super, super interesting. Cosmos, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the 2X e-commerce podcast show. Um, for those who want to find out more about Cosmos Q, it's Cosmos, that's K-O-S-M-O-S-Q dot com. Um, and um, are you active in any sort? Well, you are active. You've got, you're, you're quite active on all social media. So search for Cosmos um, and you will find Cosmos himself, you know, on the YouTube channel. Cosmos, thank you so, so, so much. You bet, Kunai. Thank you for having me, my friend. Cheers, cheers, cheers.